Great. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Product School Talk. I'm Cassandra. Really excited to have all of you here with us today. Um, as you know, we teach product management courses, coding and data at our now 14 campuses. Um, today, we have a very special guest with us. She's been um, in product management for quite some time now. So I'd like to welcome uh, Joy Guerin, former product manager at at and Hi, Joy. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Thank you. And thanks for being here with us. No problem. <laughs> um, if you want, um, I'd, I'd love for you to take a second to go over your background. And I know you just recently um, got into a new role in product management. So I'd love to, for you to tell everybody about that. Great. So just to give a brief overview of my background in product management. Um, so I started off um, in my first kind of official product management role at at and um, working on our att.net property, which was a really interesting partnership between AT&T and Yahoo at the time, um, where a lot of the revenue was driven off of search and advertising revenue. Um, and then from there, I moved into product management at Career Builder, where I was most recently. I started off working on job search, um, so more of a back-end product that served a lot of different customers and moved from there into um, a role supporting our growth marketing, SEO, digital marketing efforts, and then also looking at how we could leverage our um, market data to provide better information and insights around salary um, and skills and all of those sorts of things. Um, and most recently, I just moved into a new role at Park Mobile um, here in Atlanta. And Park Mobile is a mobile payments provider for lots of different venues and on-street parking. Um, so really excited to be starting that new role as well. Awesome, and congratulations on the new role. Thank you. Um, uh, so I know you have a presentation uh, prepared for us today, so I'll give you a, a couple seconds to set that up. And um, guys, while she's setting that up, um, just a quick reminder, we're going to take questions following her presentation. So you're welcome to type in your questions uh, in the comment section on Facebook, and we'll get to those right when she's finished. All right, so I hope everybody is able to see my screen. I'm going to go ahead and go into presentation mode. Cassandra, does everything look okay on your side? It looks great. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So I wanted to talk a little bit today, just from an informal perspective about delivering value for products and to talk a little bit about what that means to me. Um, so as a new product manager, um, come, when I first started, I think you read a lot of information about what product management ideally should look like um, and kind of all of the different frameworks and considerations and different things that you should be thinking about in order to really be an effective um, and, and great product manager. But I think that the real world sometimes presents opportunities that and situations that are a little bit different. Um, and you have a lot of different stakeholders often who all have valid um, concerns and different features that they need added and things that are important. And it's really difficult sometimes to prioritize and, and you have to figure out what is your true north and what's your north star, what's the most important metric that you're really trying to drive and stay clear about that. Um, even though sometimes it's hard with a lot of different um, people who, are, who need things from the product and who are looking to have their work prioritized. So to start off, um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about was um, this pragmatic marketing framework. So um, I don't know if all of you have seen this before, but it's something that I've used quite a bit um, in my time as a product manager and as I continue to grow as a product manager to really try to put into context um, what are all of the things that I need to be thinking about and where my stakeholders may be coming from and what they're thinking about. Um, so if you look here, it ranges from strategic to strategic to tactical, and there are a lot of different columns here that um, really highlight a lot of those different concerns. So if you're looking at, you know, strategy, um, there's different concerns versus, you know, the technical sides and and co things coming from marketing and sales. Um, and even in a product management role, sometimes um, depending on the type of organization you're in or the type of product that you're working on, um, you may find that sometimes um, the work that you do day to day may be more leaning toward one of these areas and sometimes it may encompass all of them. Um, so it really just depends on the situation, the customers you're serving, kind of the nature of the product partnership, um, any partnerships that you may be um, 
managing as well as part of your product roadmap. So I wanted to kind of place this here just as something to think about um, and as a good reference point to go back to. So from here, I want to give a couple of examples of situations that I have found myself in where different organizations and different products um, have really um, provided an opportunity for there to be a few challenges for me um, trying to figure out what's my North Star and um, where should I be focused in order to really deliver value for the product and to the users and also to the business. So case one here is a white label portal. So this is um, kind of an illustration of the product that I worked on, the type of product that I worked on when I was at at and So we were partner A and you know, partner B, you could say was um, you know, who we were working with. And our key revenue driver was search and display ads. We had five and a half weekly users, five and a half million weekly users that were looking for relevant personalized content they were looking to easily and effectively manage their accounts and manage their commu email communications um, you know, as easily and simply as possible. So that's a pretty clear need, this list of needs from our users. Um, but if you're looking at partner A, which represented my side of the product, um, some of the things that we were looking to accomplish and that really were guiding my true north were to increase visits and searches per user. Um, we wanted to promote our own licensed and original content and also advertise core products and promotions. Um, but the partner that we were working with um, also had their own set of um, performance indicators and, and objectives that they were looking to achieve as well. So we were aligned on the first one. They also were looking to increase visits and searches per user, but then they also had unique um, content for their articles and videos that they wanted to drive more views to because they there were advertisements um, there that they were looking to, to get more views for. And then also they were looking to drive signups and downloads for their own sets of products as well. Now, just to give an example of why this particular um, case I wanted to call attention to it is because it was a little bit non-traditional. I think that often, you know, we think of product managers as the people who you may be sitting with your engineers and your developers. But in this case, the partner actually owned all of the technical resources. Um, and I was really, if you look at that framework, more responsible for um, the strategic part of managing the product. And so I needed to understand the differences between my users and their users. Um, even though the product was a white label, you know, we needed to figure out how do we customize to meet our user needs. You know, their users were a little younger, our users are a little older. So how does that affect the user experience and what we need to provide? Um, additionally, um, we had a lot of partnerships as, as we're looking at promoting our licensed and original content. So our licensing deals might have been different than licensing deals that they had and our content providers may have had rules around, you know, where we can display this information or the data, the, the content that they had given us, whether it was able to be displayed with our partner and all of these different things. And so I wanted to point this out because as you're thinking about how do you deliver value for the product, these are some of the things that you may run into that you have to navigate depending on how that product and the business around it is structured. So to move to another example here, case two, um, was marketplace search. So this is um, an illustration of the types of issues that we ran into at my time at Career Builder. So working on a backend search product um, that really served a two-sided marketplace, um, really looking at, first of all, um, you know, we have to serve our clients uh, who pay us. They are our key revenue driver. So client advertising fees are really the driver that keeps us keeps this product in business. Um, so we needed to be aware of the fact that our clients needed to feel like they were getting value from really advertising on our search or on our website. Um, but at the same time, our users also had particular needs. So to, to talk about the client needs, their needs were around like optimizing ranking. You know, all of our clients who advertise with us want to show up first for any particular keywords. So just like um, in a Google search, people think about SEO. Um, if you're 
you know, if your product or your organization, your company that you're working for um, has search as a major component and that's how users find products or find information, then optimizing ranking and SEO is going to be a big deal internally for your site as well. Um, so those were some of the things that our clients were looking at. They also were interested in how did they increase the, the number of relevant advocates that they got per posting. Um, and then also we had some white label clients who were very concerned about customizations and how they could really meet the needs of their users. So on the back end for search, we had to be thinking about not only um, the, the search performance and relevance for our own um, site, but also for white labels and the different needs that they had for their users. So in this case, you know, for the white labels, we would be very similar to um, the partner that I explained us to be working with in my last example. Um, also looking at, you know, the stakeholders from engineering who were also very um, focused on maintaining and upgrading the back end. You know, oftentimes if you're working with more technical products, um, technical debt is created, um, you know, there are upgrades that need to occur, patches, lots, lots of things that need to happen on the infrastructure side um, in order to support and continue to make the product run. And if you don't take care of those things, then ultimately you'll run into performance issues. So those are some things that you have to balance when you're looking at the roadmap as well. And then lastly, thinking about you know, sales, um, you know, if anything went wrong or if a, if a client was dissatisfied, um, you know, we heard about it often from sales um, and their objective was really to drive renewals, um, you know, and obviously our users, they're just looking for relevant and personalized postings and the ability to filter and, and, and you know, um, eliminate information that's not relevant to them if by chance, you know, our algorithm doesn't get it right. So there were a lot of different um, stakeholders and almost masters that we needed to please um, as a part of managing this particular product as well. So I showed you those two cases to really kind of move into this next part of the discussion, which is really about, you know, how do you actually um, define success? Defining success is really um, the key to how you navigate all of these different um, combinations of challenges or situations that you'll find um, as you journey through product management. Um, having a clear North Star and really being able to say, okay, you know, what are the, the, the business metrics that are going to be most important um, that are going to not only say that, okay, we released on time or we pushed a new feature, um, but we actually added value to the bottom line um, you know, we drove more users to the site and those users transacted in a way that we wanted them to, or they came back how we wanted them to. And, you know, those are the things that you really have to ask yourself um, and get clear on. So how do you do that? The main way that I would say that you really find your North Star and can really define success in a powerful way is by asking the right questions and also asking the hard questions. Um, so for yourself, kind of every day or, you know, on whatever cadence you think about it, you need to really be clear about, do I know what my users want today? You know, a lot of times um, product managers and organizations will find themselves in the place of saying, oh, we did a lot of research two years ago, um, so we already know what our users want. But in today's um, economy, I mean, the market is changing so quickly, particularly with technology products, that understanding and knowing what your users want is an ongoing discovery process. And you need to always be talking with them, always be gaining feedback, you know, really understanding their behaviors, both through looking at the data, but also through qualitative research as well and you know understanding their buying behaviors and who's contributing to the bottom line secondly do i really understand what drives my business um, you know as a product manager it's very important not only to understand your product that you're managing but also kind of the the broader business and you know what's driving that um, what's important to your leaders um, and and what's really going to um, you know, move your company forward, but also your product. Obviously, you need to understand, you know, is, is it more important for me to get new 
new visitors or new users, or is it more important for me to increase the number of transactions for you know, the, the users that I already have? And then those things may shift as you go along. Um, you know, you may be trying to acquire new users up to a certain point, and then your strategy will change. So really asking yourself, do I understand what's driving my business today? And then lastly, um, what percentage of my roadmap is delivering value to users versus accomplishing other goals? I think this is always a very delicate balance and something that we have to always be thinking about. Um, you know, sometimes, like I said, when you're getting a lot of requests, um, really, you know, you, you may look up and everybody, you know, your CEO or, or your VP of product, you know, there may be top down um, direction that's coming to you that says we need to do these things, um, you know, and you look up and your roadmap is filled with things that don't necessarily contribute um, to value for the product. And they're not driving what your users want or your, um, your business value either. Um, so the questions that you need to be asking your leaders when those sorts of um, directional um, directives are coming to you is, does the work that you're asking me to prioritize align with the measures of success that we've defined? And if there's a pause there and everybody in the room <laughs> realizes that, hmm, we're not all on the same page about the measures of success that we've defined, then that's a problem and you need to keep asking questions. Um, you know, I think that this is probably one of the hardest things for product organizations to do sometimes, depending on your environment, is to really, you know, take the time to lock down the strategy and say, what are we actually trying to accomplish here? And then lastly, you know, if you're getting requests from sales and finance, or, you know, if for instance, if there's a partner who's asking for a particular feature, you need to understand how does this request affect the bottom line? Because sometimes what you'll find is, you know, you have a partner who everyone believes is a huge part of your business. But if you actually sometimes look at the sales numbers um, or look at what they're paying you every month, um, what they're contributing to the bottom line may actually be quite different than the assumptions that everyone is making based on historical information. You know, the reality may be quite different. So asking the right questions and really understanding your business, understanding the numbers behind your business and all of those different things is very important. And then lastly, as you're asking these questions, knowing where to find the answers. The best thing about product that I love is that you get to partner with so many different organizations and teams and stakeholders um, around the business. And so all of them actually have the answers that you'll probably be looking for. So, you know, your user experience partners are key. And for me, I found them to be extremely valuable in helping me to not only understand um, you know, the design, which sometimes I think is what a lot of people think of when they think of UX, but to, they really are very helpful by giving voice to the data that you're seeing in your um, analytics and tracking um, by supplementing it with qualitative feedback and then translating those insights into design features, which is what they are experts at doing. You know, if, if the data and if the qualitative feedback is telling you that a user um, needs a certain thing, they're trained in really turning that into um, an experience or a flow that will optimize that user behavior in the way you want. And then customer care, for instance, you know, and account managers, they really provide valuable insights about user requests and functionality issues. Um, so, you know, they're able to answer different questions. I would say, you know, sales can help you understand the actual value, value of client accounts, which is what we mentioned a little while ago. And marketing can also help you understand things like which user segments are really driving your growth which user segments are really driving your revenue. And then those things can help you make the decisions to say like, okay, this is what we should um, really be defining as success. These are the, the, the segments of users that are really where we found product market fit and all of these different things. Um, so in my opinion, you know, looking around at your partners and really keeping those relationships strong um, and not being afraid to ask the questions um, to them and bring them into the process. As a product manager, the great thing is you don't have to have all the answers. Um, 
you know, just knowing where to go to find the answers and being able to partner and collaborate across the business in order to translate all of the information you get back into a great and successful product um, is really what, what the objective is. Um, so I know that um, we are, that's the end of the presentation I've prepared. Um, and I have, um, I don't know if I'm still sharing, but there's a, a bio and some information um, about me and where I work. My contact information is there and my LinkedIn um, if you have any questions or, or would like to, to talk further. <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you so much, Joy. Thanks for a great presentation as well. Um, a few people were asking for the slides. So if the slides are available, guys, we'll share them on the link that, um, that we provided in the, in the comments. So um, you'll be able to find them there. Um, thank you again, Joy. Uh, so Let's uh, check and see if we have some questions coming in here. Um, and also one thing I, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about is um, I, I know you mentioned working well with the team and being able to you know, ask the right questions and communicate well. Um, what's some advice that you would have for handling conflict among a, a, a team, for example, your UX or, or engineers or customer service? Um, well, I think that, um for me, what has worked best in terms of managing conflict, I like robust discussion and conversation. So I never really try to look at things as conflict. Um, what I try to minimize as a product manager is ego. I think that sometimes, you know, we may find that, um, you know, there's conflict around, you know, who has decision rights or, you know, someone thinks they have the right idea and someone else has you know, information that's different. And so it becomes conflict about what's the right decision to make. Um, I'm always looking for consensus. So I think that really being a consensus builder is extremely powerful as a skill for a product manager, because when you recognize that the people around you aren't necessarily competing with you for power, at least this is the way I like to look at it. Um, you know, they're experts in their own right, and you're all trying to make this product as great as possible. So you'll all like sink or swim together. Um, <laughs> right. for me, that's really the, the optimal way to do it. I bring my engineers, you know, my UX partners, um, you know, whomever is valuable and has information that's relevant. I try to bring them into the conversation and then we look for consensus. Awesome. Really great advice. Um, great. Um, we had another question come in through Slack. Um, can you share what, uh, what some of your favorite books are that you, uh, that you've been reading lately? Um, you know, the interesting thing is uh, one of the books I've been reading, um, which I'm sure is a really popular book, is called Hooked. Um, I've been making my way through that mm -hmm. one. I think that's, you know, everyone is looking for what's the way to, you know, drive repeat visits and repeat uses, um, those sorts of things. How do you hook a, a user? Um, but one of the things that I've been um, doing a lot from a leadership perspective, which, you know, also, you know, um, as a product manager, we have to do. <laughs> Um, I've been watching a lot of documentaries on diplomats and presidents, actually, um, people who have to um, really manage a product, if you will. I look at everything as product mm -hmm. management. I'm always looking for um, insights about how to work with people, how to understand the needs of, you know, whether it's a group of people or users or whatever it is, and then, you know, working with lots of people to kind of move, move forward. Um, and provide value. So that's what I've been doing to kind of advance myself in that area lately. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. And we always say too, to be a lifelong learner as a, as a product manager, that's that's how it goes. <laughs> so mm -hmm. awesome. Um, great. And then we have another question here from Glorian. Um, in your view, should we prioritize tasks related to users over the business or the other way around? I think that it's situational. So I think that you should have a roadmap and a vision like to start off with, um, you know, for where you're, where you want to take your product and, and, you know, what's going to be important to your users, you know, your roadmap should, should look at those things. Um, and then I think that as things from the business come up, um, I think you have to look at, you know, how important are they, you know, what are going to be the impacts if you don't deliver those things within a given time. And then you try to make, you know, the right decisions based on that. Um, I think that, you know, oftentimes those decisions are dynamic. Um, so I would say though, your roadmap should be driven and your vision should be driven for what the, the value that the product provides to the user, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then from there you look at, 
what, um, you know, what, what the needs of the business are. And usually things will start to line up and make sense because your business values should ultimately, you know, align with kind of what your users are looking for too. Right, right, exactly. Um, here, we had another question come through. This is from Siddharth. Um, what are the best practices in prioritizing your product backlog? How do you prioritize which user story should go in the backlog? And how do you deal with unfinished and overestimated user stories? So there are a couple questions there. <laughs> mm, yeah, these are good questions. Um, so I would say in terms of prioritizing the backlog, um, what I often try to look at is, um, I would say like yesterday at work, we had this come up. So um, we have a, a product, you know, some, a set of features that we need to deliver on. Um, and the, one of the things that we asked ourselves are, you know, do all of these things have to go at the same time? You know, do they need to all be packaged together? In that case, then you might, you know, prioritize them in terms of, okay, what do we need to know first before we do the next things in order? So if there are, you know, dependencies or if there are certain things that are going to be roadblocks, then we would prioritize those in a particular way. Um, in terms of overestimating or underestimating, um, we try to be re really realistic about, um, you know, our capacity and also, you know, if we don't, if we really don't know um, enough to make a solid estimation, you know, I would say always be comfortable with putting in a spike card. Um, so if you need to gather more information and, you know, just so I'm not being jargony. So a spike card is, um, you know, a card that you can put in so that your team has time to go and investigate so that they understand a little bit better, like what is what's going to be required to even um, do this work. And so when you're grooming and you don't necessarily know yet, I would say, you know, feel really comfortable with putting in a spike card so that you can learn mm -hmm. before you actually estimate the work. And then, you know, you won't have to deal with, oh, we, we gave it a five, but it was really like, a, a nine or an eight. Okay, <laughs> right. You know, and then you're stuck. So, yeah. Right. Awesome. Um, here we have time for one, maybe yeah, maybe one more question. So this one is for and from Andrew. Said so thank you for your talk, Joy. Um, I was wondering how you've communicated value when addressing technical debt, um, particularly when it's conflicting with working on new user features. I'm going to be honest. In my um, experience, that has been an ongoing challenge, um, you know, in organizations is really, you know, I feel like sometimes that has to do with organizational culture. Um, you know, I've been in organizations where the culture or the leadership um, is less technical. And so the understanding of the value of taking care of te technical debt or prioritizing technical debt um, isn't there. And, and so sometimes you have to really kind of fight those battles and, and advocate and, you know, ultimately um, you own the roadmap. So, you know, sometimes, you know, you may have to disagree and, and do what you know is best for the product. Um, and, and, you know, that can be a little scary and challenging sometimes, yeah. but, yeah. but it's also like a, a good way to stretch yourself and, and grow too. Um, I would say in organizations that are more technical, you know, when I was working on search, people understood the value a little bit more of like, okay, the search engine has to work. So, you mm -hmm. know, there was support for, um, you know, tackling technical debt in whatever way, you know, you find best to do it. Um, sometimes we would do tech debt sprints, which I don't know is the, the greatest way to do it. You know, so there's agreement and disagreement on both sides about how you manage that. But, um, you know, there was at least support for taking that on. But, um, you know, if you, if you build it in or, you know, just, yeah, I think it's just a cultural fit. Um, organizations, different organizations handle it differently. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks for thanks for taking the time to get those questions answered. Um, before before we finish, um, could you share your advice for aspiring product managers? Um, I would say, so I'll I'll share quickly. Um, my background is not in engineering. It's not 
I was a music major in college and oh, wow. uh, yeah, and, and then I went and got an MBA, but I have always um, been interested in coding. I started coding in middle school and freelanced in college and different things like that. I would say just, you know, don't be afraid to really learn, um, you know, di- like learn and dig into some of the more technical details. Um, a lot of what has, I think, helped me is my ability to communicate with developers and, you know, really convince people that I understand, um, you know, the domain or, or technology, um, even though it's not as obvious um, on my resume. Okay. Um, so I think that anything that you can do to really kind of learn about different technologies and not just at a surface level, but understanding kind of what makes them work, not saying you have to be able to go out there and build it, but yeah, I think that those are the things that are really important. And then also um, just being able to understand markets, understanding the business, understanding the numbers, um, you know, really being able to analyze data. Those are the things that to me, I have found to be extremely valuable and increasingly valuable. I think people want to know that um, product managers are comfortable with large amounts of data um, and, and the ability to really work with those engineers and, uh, and leverage that data to make a better product. Awesome. Definitely great advice too. It is, it is good to have some kind of um, ability to communicate with your team and understanding of, of what, what they're doing essentially. Um, so great. Thank you so much, Joy. Really appreciate it. It was a great presentation and thanks for getting to all those questions. <laughs> Of course. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the time and um, hopefully it was helpful. Yeah, it was great. Um, And thanks to everybody who joined uh, today. Um, Guys, if you type book in the comments, you'll get a free copy of the products book uh, just for joining us today. And uh, of course, you can find more about us at productschool.com. So thanks so much for everyone being here today and have a great rest of your days. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.